Mistakes Over Failure, where CEOs and board members from around the world share the good, the bad, and the ugly of their diversity and inclusion journeys. We are CEOs. We understand the pressures of leadership and the rules that are often unwritten. I'm Dr. Christine Crawford. And I'm Leslie Wingo. Together, we're here to spark honest and frank conversations that will encourage us to think differently, learn from failures, avoid inaction, and encourage each of us to make mistakes. The world needs better leaders, and we can become better together. Welcome to Mistakes Over Failure. I'm Leslie Wingo. And I'm Dr. Christine Crawford. Our guest today is Brett Hurt, CEO and co-founder of Data.World. If you Google Brett, you'll learn that he's an extremely successful entrepreneur and investor. He is accomplished academically with the Wharton MBA. He is a father and a husband. What you may not find is how much he adores and enjoys his family, that he is the kind of smart that makes those around him even smarter, And if you are fortunate enough to belong to any of his communities, Faith, Austin, or the Aspen Global Leadership Network, you know that he is engaged, committed, and kind. So welcome, Brett, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like I shouldn't say anything from this point. (laughs) And just, (laughs) I really appreciate it. All right, well, let's do the thing. In an open letter to CEOs and tech leaders, you said, I believe the more success you earn, both by grit and luck, and the more educated you become on the very real history of racial inequities in our country, the greater moral imperative you have to strive for a much, much more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce in tech. Can you describe your journey, both personal and professional, that led your company, Data.World, being incredibly 59% female or minority-led? But yeah, how did, tell us a little bit how that went for you in that journey. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up. So just some context here. Everybody during this pandemic has been doing their own, own version of kind of build back better. And one of my versions has been working on things that I've wanted to work on for a long time. And I've been, it's, this, this message has been building inside of me for years, but I'd never actually put pen to paper. So I did that on December I think it was 29th of 2020. And I really wanted to get a call to action out there and use the voice that I have, at least here in Austin and hopefully in the tech community around the US to say to tech leaders, hey, you can actually build a very diverse company in tech and here's how to do it. And if you do it, you'll have a company that is more American that is a lot more fun to work at and performs better. And so I I just laid it all out there. And the way that I got to that part of the journey is I'm a product of a lot of people that have put a lot of love into me, (laughs) you know, starting with my mom, my blog, lucky7.io is named as a tribute to my mom. I found my passion when I was age seven. I started programming them. She bought me my first computer. She learned how to program with me. And then growing up here in Texas, I was surrounded by a lot of judgment for a kid programming starting in 1979, back when that was very weird and not normal. And so I would hear things around the Thanksgiving table and in various places where they would tell my mom in front of me, you're ruining that kid. And all he knows how to do is work on computers. (laughs) And it would infuriate my mom because she would be like, leave him alone. He's found his passion. And, you know, how lucky is he to have found that? And so I named my, my blog as a tribute to her. So there's just a lot of people in my life that have invested in me. And I'll never forget when Josh Baer who's the co-founder and CEO of Capital Factory, which is our largest tech incubator and one of our largest VCs here in Austin, said, hey, I've nominated you for the Henry Crown Fellowship at the Aspen Institute because it's the most amazing thing I've ever done. And I really think you'll love it. I had taken my prior company public 
and it had over a billion dollar valuation. We had an amazing team there. I had an amazing co-founder. It was a dream come true entrepreneurially. It meant that I never had to work again unless I wanted to. But you know, there was something gnawing at me that maybe I wasn't quite done yet, or I, I didn't really know what to do, frankly. And so he saw this, he saw this potential in me. And fortunately, I got in. And then the Henry Crown Fellowship exposed me to a group of the most diverse leaders I've ever been in. So you and I both did courageous conversations. And I think it's the, the perspective that you bring because you're, you just have this incredible way of looking at the world from several different mm-hmm. views. Did courageous conversation give you that, that moment, that aha moment of change? Or what was that change? What made you come to the realization that things had to change from where you sit, from your vantage point? Through the, through the group, through the Henry Crown Fellowship, I started to realize, actually, this is still a big problem for our country. And I knew that because I was around leaders of color who were experiencing this still after all they've accomplished and everything else. And it really broke my heart to realize that. Like that really kind of broke and really opened my heart. And so that was a seed planted. And then later, if you fast forward, you know, Leslie to Courageous Conversations, that was actually a white man telling me about that and a white woman. So it was Steven Strauss and Heather Bruner. Heather Bruner used to be my COO at Bizarre Voice, and she was just absolutely an exceptional leader. And now she's the CEO of a unicorn here in Austin that she's been there since it was very early stage called WP Engine. They're the leader in WordPress hosting around the world. And they said, Brett, you've got to take this. You know, we, we've taken this program and you have to take it. And of course I was going to take it. And so I took the program and that then exposed me again to a lot of exercises we did together, including the color wheel, which is where you all stand in a circle and you stand by a list of questions, which really gets you in touch with actually how privileged you are. And you see everybody. And these are people that you've now gone through the course with. And you can see like where it goes to the least privileged people in the room. And of course, it's like the white men standing up front And then it just keeps going eventually till it's like black women, for example. And that also really broke my heart. Mm -hmm. So, so Brent, how did you go from a broken heart to action in your business? Like, what did that look like? Right. Because to learn things and you are such an intellectual, right? So the reading and the writing and the, that part of it, um, you are a student of things, but how do you move from that heartbreak into doing something? So I, I, I was struggling with, well, what do I do now that my heart is broken and I know this is the case? And then it occurred to me at Bizarre Voice, we became so successful that there have now been over 60 companies started by former Bizarre Voice people. And when you start a company, you can be very deliberate with who you choose to hire. And one of the things that people get really wrong when it comes to building a company is that it's very, very easy to hire people in your immediate social network. And you're both Black women... So for example, you're going to get invited to events where there are more black women. I'm not as a white man. I'll be invited to more events where there's maybe Jewish Americans. I know a lot of Jewish people. Um, you know, I'm very involved in the Jewish community and our synagogue and, and everything else. But, you know, we're all kind of typecast a bit. And there's actually a level of beauty in it too, that we pull together and, you know, we support each other in these groups. You know, there's different content, for example, at conferences sometimes for women and the struggles that women have in progressing in their careers. And there's different content that's programmed to them. So there's reasons why we have these different events that are focused on different groups. But when you start a company, if you're not intentional about it, you'll end up just being primarily white men. And that is, in fact, what happened at the beginning of Data.World. 
which I'm embarrassed to say. We were 12 people and there was not a single woman on board at the beginning of Data.World. And I told the team, I was like, hey, and this was before, this was before Courageous Conversations, the university. This is before George Floyd. This is before a, a lot of things. And I told the team, I said, oh my gosh, guys, because they're all guys, <laughs> we're really doing it wrong. We're not going to be a place that women want to work if there's no women here. And they've got to be the first woman to join an all-male team. And so I'm like, we can't hire a single additional person, period, unless they're female. And then we started to change the shape of things. And as you noted at the beginning of this, we're now 59% either female or people of color at data.world. But it had to be deliberate and then I always get this pushback from people to say, and I get this primarily from white women where they say, hey, I would like to be a diverse company too. I believe in equality. I believe in America. I believe in the big melting pot that we are. But there's just, you know, there's really just not a lot of minorities in tech. And I'm like, well, where have you been hanging out? Like, are you showing up at the places where there are diverse people? Because if you're not explicitly trying to show up in those places, then you're just going to get invited to a lot of events that are dominated by white men. And so then you're going to, you're going to be in this bubble where you assume that the whole world is, you know, white men. And so you've got to be very deliberate about it. And the payoff is huge. Like if you hire, for example, a bunch of females in your company, guess, guess who they're going to bring on board? They're going to bring on board people from their direct social network because They're hanging out at a lot of conferences and events where there's a lot of females. If you hire Black Americans for your company, guess who they're going to bring on board? If you hire Hispanic Americans, guess who they're going to bring on board? So eventually you can change the shape of these things over time. And the payoff is you're going to have a company that's a lot more fun to work at. You're going to have a company that has a much richer culture that approaches things from perspectives where you're really going to be able to look around the corners much more quickly and form much better strategies. So, Brett, was there anything about this transition at data.world that was hard? Or was there anything that you that you tried and didn't work or anything that you were surprised didn't get any traction? Because you talk about, you know, hanging out different places and success, about propagating success. But were there any missteps or things you maybe in hindsight it was it was hard initially because we had to figure out well where do we show up and then when you do a little research and a little homework on it um, you find out that there are a ton of groups out there there's a group called Black U Tech in Austin the Hispanic Hackers group in Austin I mean there's all types of groups that really open up and they they actually want people to come in and say hey. How can we help? Just how can we help? Like a lot of times that's the best thing that you can say to people. The other thing is that we really, um, I got involved in another group. I mean, it's just like so many examples of people who have really put a lot of love in to me. I got involved in another group, which is now called Recode the Quo that uh, Steve Sachs started, a white man, also a Jewish man. I know him well for, through the Jewish community. And uh, he got quite a few people involved there, like Muna. I can't remember Muna's last name right now, but um, she was especially helpful in a review of our website. And she said, well, I understand you want to build a diverse company for this type of payoff and et cetera. As an entrepreneur, like part of the payoff is like you want to build a company where you're really proud to work yourself. She said, but... Your website doesn't communicate that. <laughs> I'm like, you're absolutely right. Like in your job descriptions, don't communicate that. So if you go to our website today, it really communicates. And, you know, we, we started that years ago, but we were unintentionally not designing and describing in a way that would actually attract people of color and attract diverse populations because it just didn't look like we were prioritizing it from the outside, even though we we're prioritizing it from the inside. 
I have a question for you. Sure. It's interesting when we think about DEI initiatives and what that looks like for for America now and going forward. Are there initiatives that you see that have worked and initiatives that you've seen that haven't worked? How do leaders start to incorporate some of the things that you're talking about into what they're doing, not only from a personal perspective, but from an organizational one as well? Well, so part of what you should realize about me is that I've never worked at a big company since I was 24 years old. Okay. And I just turned 50 on Valentine's Day. So I don't have the big company lessons other than what I listen to on podcast. And I've listened to a lot of podcasts about how big companies are really messing this up. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking to, to hear that and the disparity and pay and everything else that sometimes really hurts these initiatives so much at these, at these big companies. So I'm not a person that can speak to the big company experience and how that gets messed up. I can only speak to our experience as a startup, a company that now has 126 people and hopefully will have over 200 people by the end of this year. I will tell you one thing, just to diverge for one second. One thing that I really believed strongly before the pandemic is that companies had to be built in person in offices. And we did that at Bizarre Voice. Like, as a matter of fact, I was so dogmatic on that at Bizarre Voice that we didn't hire someone outside of Austin until we opened our London office once we went into Europe. And the proof was in the pudding in, in, in several ways of that in person culture. First of all, we got named the top place to work in Austin when we're small, then medium, then large. Secondly, when we went public at over a billion dollar valuation, we had only raised 23 million and we had 13 million left in the bank when we went public. So like huge advantages of being in person. So I thought, well, this is just the way you do it. And I built core metrics alongside a great team also in person. So I was terrified at the beginning of the pandemic, absolutely terrified at what is this gonna mean? for our company's future. Like, are we going to die now? Because we weren't yet at repeatable product market fit at the very beginning of the pandemic. We, we had a lot of customers who loved us, but we weren't yet at that mode where we knew if we hired people in sales that we knew exactly what they should do and they were going to blow away their goals. So I was terrified because I was like, now we're going to do all this remote. And what happened is we actually really thrived. Like we pulled together as a team. We did extremely well. During the pandemic, we beat all four of our COVID financial planning scenarios. We never took PPP money or anything like that. And, you know, we just raised $50 million from Goldman Sachs. So things really turned out well in the end. But one of the things that we picked up during this time is, you know what, we can hire the unicorn candidates outside of Austin, because we're all just on Zoom anyways, mm -hmm. during this period. And then we started to hire some of our best people ever outside of Austin. And so today, you know, over 30% of our people now are outside of Austin. And one of the beautiful opportunities, I think that the pandemic uncovers, is that you can build a diverse company now much more easily. Right than before, because as long as you embrace the benefit of remote work, and we still come in the office regularly, and every quarter we fly everybody in for our big all hands, and it's a really big celebration and a time to build up that in-person trust that can only occur in person. I mean, if you, if you think about like a family reunion, and if you just try to do it over Zoom versus in person where you can give everybody hugs, it's just not the same. <laughs> but, you know, that trust bank in, in, what I'm finding out can build up very, very quickly. And it makes building a diverse team much easier if you embrace the power of remote work because there's people that are literally the unicorn candidates. Like and by unicorn candidate, I mean, you, you've got all the spec of like everything you want out of that candidate. And you're like, and I also want to hire someone, this female, for example. 
And that may be really hard to find in a highly, highly, highly competitive job market like Austin is now with Tesla moving here and, you know, Oracle's headquarters here and everything yeah. else. So the fact that we've learned that is a real example of an old dog learning a new trick because I would not have guessed that at the beginning of the pandemic. I would not have guessed that we were going to embrace this hire people wherever they are. And, and I'm so glad we did. It's one of the best things that, that we've done today. And it's allowed us to be much more diverse as well, like to, to really feed on that. Well, thank you, Brett. We are quickly um, running out of time. It feels like we've been on here for five minutes. Um, but <laughs> Leslie is going to go through some rapid questions with you okay, to end awesome. up the interview. All right. Rapid fire. Rapid fire. So simple one answer, maybe two answer questions. I, and I'm surprised that I don't know some of these about you. So here we go. <laughs> Getting okay. to know you by Leslie and Christine. <laughs> what was your first job? My very first job well, let me answer it in two parts real quickly. So it was working for my parents. My parents had furniture stores from the time I was born. And I worked in the stores, talking with the customers, you know, lifting that heavy furniture with my dad, <laughs> doing all that, helping my dad with his fishing light. He, he invented the first halogen fishing light and sold those all over. And, you know, I would help him with packaging and everything else. But my first job outside of working for my parents, which frankly did not pay very well at all. <laughs> I don't, I think it was definitely, there's some child labor laws involved there <laughs> was, um, working and, and it's surprising that you're going to hear me say this. I was a freshman in college and I worked for a daycare that <laughs> summer for kids that were between seven and nine years old. And it, the way it happened is I was working out at the gym and this woman who, who was also working out and I started talking and she's a much older woman, had her own business. And she was like, Hey, I'm looking for someone to, you know, hire for this. And, and I was like, okay. Um, and the funny thing about that job is that I have such a heart for teachers because it is the hardest job that I have ever done to date, <laughs> period. I mean, my mom said, I've never seen bags under your eyes. <laughs> I saw. And, and, you know, I'm a young man, man. I'm a freshman in college. Um, but I was, I was good at it, except I totally failed on the macaroni art part. Like, Very I was, nice. The, all the kids excelled in sports after that. They were like, my kids are coming home so tired. I was like, well, all we do all day is play sports because that's all I know how to do. I don't know how to do macaroni art. <laughs> so my next question is, which colleague or coworker taught you the most? Oh, gosh. Um, I have to really think about that because um, there, there's so many people that I've learned so much from. I would say, I would say it's Bong Sa. His last name is S-U-H. Mm -hmm. And he was my first real mentor during my core metrics days. So I started core metrics as one of the first web analytics companies and one of the first software as a service companies ever. When I was 26, he was my first board member to join and really took me under his wing and said, I'm going to mentor you and just did it with such a great heart. And I just made so many amazingly bad mistakes <laughs> and he just was always very gracious with me. And, and, and today he actually helps data.world. He's one of our advisory board members and he just wrote a testimonial for the second edition for the entrepreneurs essentials, which comes out in the next three weeks. What is your favorite book that you Probably. have not written? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My favorite book is uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Okay. And so that book, Man's Search for Meaning, I always tell people any human being should read that book as one of the top three most important books of their life okay. and then search for that meaning in their life. Because once you find that meaning, you're propelled by it. Business acronyms, love them or hate them? 
I personally don't like them because <laughs> I, uh, I, I really model myself to the greatest extent possible after Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. Warren Buffett is the world's best investor, but he never makes anybody feel like an idiot. And he could make us all feel like idiots because <laughs> he knows more about investing mm-hmm. than all of us. Yeah. Um, and he reads obsessively and he uses language that everybody can understand. What is your guilty pleasure? Um, let's see. <laughs> guilty pleasure. I mean, I love margaritas. <laughs> You know, I'm an Austin boy. I'm an Austin boy. So like, I love margaritas. I don't drink them every night, but if I'm out, I'm usually looking for (laughs) what's on the list that is margarita like. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I really, especially have become fond of mezcal margaritas because you get that smoky and sweet in one drink. What is the job you've always wanted, but haven't done so yet? Well, I thought it, I, I thought at one point that I would be a good mayor for Austin, but my wife says that's not <laughs> happening ever. And she knows me best. We've been married almost 26 years now. And part of the reason I even started to think that way, frankly, was because of the Aspen Institute. So I started to think like, well, if I wasn't an entrepreneur, what would I be doing and I got pretty energized at one point thinking, well, maybe that's it. Maybe I'll, maybe eventually I'll run for mayor. Um, but I, I really think that she's right in the sense that I love being an entrepreneur and I can affect change in the world best that way. And then the second best thing is that I love investing in entrepreneurs. My wife and I have a family office where we're now investors in 40 VC funds and 124 startups of which 77 are here in Austin. And I especially run to meet with female entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs of color. Again, because you can be very intentional with where you spend your time. And by the way, my number one performing company that I've ever invested in to date, outside of, of course, my own companies, (laughs) is Everlywell. Yeah. Which I was one of the initial investors. And guess what? It's led by a woman, Julia Chi. And it's already worth over two billion. And I think I my opinion is it's on its way to twenty. That's great. great. And it's and it's homegrown here in Austin. Amazing company. What emoji do you use the most often when you're texting? The heart emoji. Of it. What is your, I wish I had started doing this earlier in my life. So I read this book. This is going to be a little bit of a cheat because I get to get another book (laughs) plug in there. I read this book called Fierce Conversations Uh by a woman, uh, Suzanne Scott or Susan Scott. And it's all about how life changes one fierce conversation at a time. And if you think about the most intense conversations you've ever had, whether it's like a decision on whether or not to get married or whether or not to have children or what school you're going to go to or whatever it is, you know, what company you're going to start. These are very impassioned conversations. And that book walks you through how to have them. And the downside of how I grew up as a guy literally behind a computer for over 40 hours a week from age 7 to 21 is that I was pretty introverted and I didn't know how to actually like have direct conversations with people about really important things. And so I recommend that book to anybody that is looking to have a fierce conversation, which doesn't mean a yelling conversation. That's not <laughs> what it means. It just means fierce as in, you know, this is a make or break type conversation for you. This is my last question for you. And I just want to preface it with this. We named the podcast Mistakes Over Failures. And the idea is failures are something that people do over and over and over, and they just never learn from them. But a mistake is when you like shoot for something big and it just, it doesn't work for whatever reason and you learn from it. So the last question is, what is the one mistake that changed you? So I've made a ton of mistakes. <laughs> um, the, the biggest mistake that I've made in career is 
during the core metrics days, back when I started that company, I was, I was 26. As I mentioned, I just finished my MBA from Morgan. I was paying myself zero dollars. You know, all my friends are making 200,000 and up. And I'm here like trying to just find initial product market fit with one of the first SaaS companies. And my investors were like, Hey, Brett, this is going to be huge. This is going to be a multi billion dollar company. And it was the go go days of the dot com boom. Mm -hmm. And we quickly hired about 100 people. And we didn't have anywhere near the amount of revenue to justify that. We did have very referenceable, passionate customers. And then the dot com bust happened. And we lost 97 of our 100 customers because they all went out of business. And I had to let go of two thirds of our team. And it literally broke my heart. I mean, I was Richard Hendricks in that show Silicon Valley throwing up in the trash can, you know, mm -hmm. types of things you see. My wife can barely watch that show because she's like, I've lived all of this with you, buddy. You know, I became an entrepreneur after I got married. And, and she's seen all the drama that sometimes unfolds in entrepreneurship. And I would walk around with her in San Francisco saying, I literally feel like I'm being punched in the gut every single day. And at Bizarre Voice, the way that came into play is when that great recession hit. And I thought, uh-oh, this could be really, really bad. We just stopped hiring, period, for six months. And we beat our goals all through that period by pulling together. We, we had to work much harder, but frankly, it was a very scary time in the US. You remember that time and in the world, period. Like we all thought mm -hmm. we were teetering on the brink of a great depression. And if some of those bailouts hadn't happened, it may have actually turned into that. I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a economic, you know, I'm not an economist. So I don't really know what would have happened if we hadn't bailed out, but it was pretty, pretty scary. And we beat our goals during that time. And then we started hiring again and it made our company much more resilient and strong because of that. Well, just, just want to thank you, Brett, for your vulnerability and your honesty and sharing with us how heartbreak and mistakes can lead to impact and change. And it's no surprise at all that the heart is your favorite emoji. And I think that's... <laughs> That is you, and I think that is um, the story that you shared with us in one bit. So again, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We are Mistakes Over Failures, a podcast by YPO, the global leadership community of extraordinary chief executives. 